Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? Well, good evening. My name is John Hughes. I'm an editor for Bloomberg First Word. That's Bloomberg News' breaking news desk here in Washington. And I am the president of the National Press Club. Thank you. I want to welcome you here tonight. This is an exciting night for the club. It's one of our biggest nights of the year, in fact. We will recognize Gwen Eiffel with our very highest honor, the Fourth Estate Award. Now, Gwen, quite simply, is one of the most prolific and respected journalists of our time. Her career has spanned the pinnacles of both print and broadcast. She has authored a highly regarded book about politics and race. And of course, we know her for her, fast, her past work as a debate moderator. Her current role is co-anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour, along with Judy Woodruff. The team has been called the heart and soul of this legendary news program. Gwen brings her trademark analytical skills and journalist savvy to the show, along with her sterling reputation for fairness and balance. She is also, I have to say, one of the most well-liked and collegial members of the Fourth Estate here in Washington. We are so pleased to be honoring her tonight. Gwen, welcome and congratulations. Now we are joined tonight by a head table of distinguished guests, and I want to introduce them to you now. Please hold your applause until everybody up here has been introduced, and then we'll, uh, we'll give them an applause at one time. So from the audience's left, Barbara Bird is a fourth estate dinner committee member. Dan Balls is political reporter for the Washington Post. Barbara Cochran of the University of Missouri is president of the National Press Club Journalism Institute. And of course, our guest of honor is Gwen Eiffel. Charlene Hunter Galt is a journalist and former correspondent of NPR and PBS, among other things, and we'll be hearing a little more later. And Michelle Norris is a special correspondent for National Public Radio. Gail DeGeorge, a former editor with Bloomberg, is the chairwoman of this year's Fourth Estate Dinner. I would also like to recognize the leadership of the National Press Club and of the National Press Club Journalism Institute. Will board members and officers of those two organizations please stand and be recognized? We have past presidents of the National Press Club here tonight. Would past presidents please stand and be recognized? <laughs> One former president is not with us tonight, but he does deserve special recognition. More than 40 years ago, Don Larrabee brought us our very first Fourth Estate Award dinner and that night, we honored the great Walter Cronkite. Don was instrumental in putting together countless Fourth Estate dinners since then. Thank you, Don, for giving the club this signature event. We wish you were here with us. And tonight's dinner benefits the National Press Club Journalism Institute. To tell us a little bit more about the Institute, please give a warm welcome to its president, Barbara Cochran. Well, hello, everyone. It's so nice to see you all here tonight. And I'm especially pleased that we're saluting Gwen Eiffel. Gwen has been a friend for many years, and it has been a real pleasure to follow the amazing trajectory of her career. 
She mastered reporting first for print and now for television. And I'm a huge fan of Gwen's ability to get to the heart of any story she covers and to lead a civil and insightful conversation about the most important issues of our day. She's also a role model for women and for women of color and inspires countless young reporters to do better, to do more, and to be more. The National Press Club Journalism Institute is the nonprofit educational arm of the National Press Club. As the journalism profession evolves in new ways, the Institute provides training programs designed to keep journalists at the forefront of innovative reporting tools and techniques. The Institute also honors great journalism through its annual awards program and works to build the next generation of journalists through a scholarship program. <coughs> Tonight, I want to take a moment to tell you about this year's recipient of the National Press Club's Diversity Scholarship for Studies in Journalism. Her name is Megan Zanis from Westchester, Ohio, and she's a freshman at Miami University of Ohio. I'll let Megan tell you the rest of her inspiring story in her own words, which she delivered when she was officially named this year's scholarship recipient. Let's watch. I have always loved words. It's why there's a stack of 50 books on my bedroom floor waiting to be read because there's simply no room left on my bookshelf. It's why I skipped a trip to an amusement park when I was seven years old in favor of staying home to read the new Harry Potter book. <laughs> it's why I started my own blog in sixth grade and why my little brother still yells at me for using big words that he doesn't understand. It's why I'm a card-carrying member of the Grandma Police and a columnist at Major League Baseball. It's why I took an interest in public speaking so I can share my story to motivate and inspire others. It's why I want to be a journalist and publish a memoir and do a TED Talk. It's why I'll be attending Miami University in Oxford, Ohio this fall as part of a writing program, uh, honors program in writing for the media. And it's why I'm here tonight. From the get-go, my lifestyle has been anything but typical and not always by choice. I was born with a very rare neurological disorder that rendered me unable to feel pain, temperature, and touch. I'm also deaf. If the fact that there are an estimated 50 cases of this disorder in the world doesn't give me a different take on the world, I don't know what does. I spent most of my childhood surrounded by doctors and nurses and therapists, and not a whole lot of kids my own age. That's when I started retreating into books as an escape and writing down my thoughts as an outlet. So at a young age, I learned that words are powerful. And I'm so glad that I had the right ones, the inspiring ones, the courageous ones, available to me when I was growing up. I want to be that voice for the next generation. And I want to harness the power of those words as I continue my career in journalism. I could not be more grateful that all of you here at the Press Club believe in that dream and have taken, helped me take the next step forward and achieving it. Thank you very much. Pretty amazing. And because of your support of events like tonight's dinner, the Journalism Institute is able to help promising young journalists like Megan. So thank you for being here, and thank you for helping the next generation of great journalists. And now I'll turn the program back over to John. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. So what you just saw shows some of the Institute's excellent work. And if you came to the club to see the excellent training and professional development that goes on here, you will see an additional example of that excellent work. But there is more. Throughout 2015, we have focused our fight for press freedom on three journalists who right now are being held in foreign prisons. They are Austin Tice, a freelance journalist being held in Syria, Khadija Ismailova, 
who is being held in Azerbaijan, and Jason Rezaian, a Washington Post reporter who has been jailed in Tehran for 450 days. Earlier this year, the Press Club and Journalism Institute boards voted to transfer press freedom programs from the club to the Journalism Institute. That means that for the first time, some proceeds from this evening's dinner will support our important press freedom efforts. So tonight, we are doing more than thinking about Austin, Khadija, and Jason. We are raising money so that we can continue our work to get these journalists released, and we are raising money so that no more reporters are jailed just for doing their jobs. you now have an additional opportunity to contribute. There is a silent auction happening in our lobby. There are some great items. There's a week-long stay at a magnificent home in France. There's VIP tickets to The Late Show with Stephen Colbert in New York. There's a one-night stay at the historic homestead in Hot Springs, Virginia, or the exclusive Salamander Resort and Spa in Middleburg, Virginia. Please take a moment to have a look and place those bids. You don't have much time. Bidding closes at 8.15. We want to send a special thank you to our silent auction sponsors, and they are listed in your program. We want to give special thanks to our two gold level sponsors for tonight's dinner. They are Bloomberg and Toyota. Both companies have been longtime supporters of the Journalism Institute, and we are grateful to both of them. Bloomberg employees Andrea Snyder and Angela Greiling Keen serve with me on the Press Club and Institute boards, respectively. Ed Lewis of Toyota serves on the Journalism Institute board and is someone whom we have counted on for so long in so many ways. We also want to thank our Silver Level sponsors. Brown Capital Management, which has supported this dinner for a number of years. Thank you to Eddie C. Brown, the author of Beating the Odds, Eddie Brown's Investing in Life Strategies. The American Petroleum Institute is now a sponsor for the fourth year, and we want to thank API for their sponsorship. The National Cable Telecommunications Association is a three-time sponsor at the silver level. Rob Stoddard, NCTA's Senior Vice President for Communications and Public Affairs serves on the Journalism Institute Board, and we thank him for his support. Our bronze level sponsors are Syngenta, a global leader in agribusiness. They are a new sponsor this year. Thank you, Syngenta. And Ridgewells, we extend our thanks to Ridgewells for again providing the lovely tablecloths. Let's have a round of applause for all of our sponsors. Now, please enjoy your delicious dinner prepared by the club's executive chef, Susan Delbert, and her talented staff. I'll be back a bit later to introduce our guests and our honoree. Thank you. Good evening once again. May I have your attention, please? Good evening. I hope you are enjoying this wonderful dinner, and I hope that you took part in the silent auction, which is now closed. It's time for the moment we have been waiting for, our tribute to Gwen Eiffel. We will begin with a video from some of Gwen's friends and colleagues. Good evening, I'm Gwen Eiffel. And I'm Judy Woodruff. On the news hour tonight. Hello, Gwen, from your partner in crime. I am so sorry not to be there tonight with all of you to pay tribute to this amazing woman, this force of nature, the daughter of a preacher who has gone on to become one of America's preeminent journalists. This is Washington Week with Gwen Eiffel. Welcome to Sunday Spin. I'm Gwen Eiffel. And I'm David Bloom. 
Here's NBC's Gwen Eiffel. To our new senior correspondent, Gwen Eiffel. Well, Gwen Eiffel. <laughs> Gwen Eiffel. Gwen, I am going to start with you, the reporter at the table. Now with only a month to go before the Iowa caucuses, these long-suffering voters are being bombarded by presidential candidates who say they can fix Washington. I think she always, almost always wanted to be a journalist. She was always curious. She always wanted to get sort of the story, if you will. She was always interested in what people were saying uh, about issues or about each other. Uh, she naturally gravitated to journalism and communications even before we really knew what it was. One thing you can certainly say, Gwen, about Bill Clinton, and that is that he is a survivor. And I think we'll have to say you're a survivor, too, because <laughs> you've been the New York Times reporter who has been right at his side covering his campaign all year. We are here in Pennsylvania. Hello from Iowa. Gwen Eiffel, NBC News, Manchester. Once again, from the Mahaffey Theater at the Progress Energy Center for the Arts, here's moderator Gwen Eiffel. Thank you. The thing about Gwen is that not only is she deeply smart, not only does she have an unerring nose for news, but she cares about the people around her. Virginia, you look like you want to cry again. Y'all oh, <laughs> trying to start something. <laughs> An evening with Diane Carroll. And now to our host, veteran PBS TV journalist, Miss Gwen Eiffel. Every once in a while, when I'm walking down the street, especially in Washington, a little black girl will come up to me and say, I know you. We are joined here today by one of the survivors of the Emanuel AME shooting, Holly Shepard. What did you think of your reception tonight? How, as Vice President, would you work to shrink this gap of polarization which has sprung up in Washington, which you both have spoken about here tonight? We keep hearing about this new face of the Republican Party. What is that? Well, one of the things that Iraq has, has shown us about the face of the military is so many people serving in these open-ended deployments are people who join the National Guard or reservists who didn't sign up thinking this was really what service meant. Has that affected our ability to prosecute this war? How has America's stance toward warfare in an environment like this changed, not only since 9-11, but since in this particular war? Let's start by talking about security in Afghanistan. How would you assess it now? Wouldn't it be insane of you to run for office again? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to be a little bit crazy to run for president, let me just put it like that. Do you worry at all that a U.S. attack could backfire? Well, I. I I think you always have to take uh, all precautions. Hello, John. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. We'll just call the breakthrough. Yes. Now, when did you come up with the title? Because uh, let's say he doesn't get the nomination. You've clearly been writing this. What do you call it? Nice try. What do you, what do you, <laughs> what do you call the book? Thank you, Gwen. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. What's Gwen like as a journalist? Well, she's an enthusiast, which means you can talk to her about any topic. And she's curious, and she has something to say. She is skeptical without being a cynic, which means the conversations can last more than five minutes before they get tiresome. And she's just a great deal of fun to be around. Gwen's a rock star. I mean, there's almost uh, uh, no journalist out there who is able to handle all the different types of journalism uh, that we see, whether it be print, broadcast, radio, TV. She can do it all. She's genuinely interested in the story. She just wants to hear more, learn more. She has an insatiable sense of curiosity. Wherever I go, no matter where I travel, if someone recognizes me, even without knowing my name, what they want to talk about is Gwen, and they want to ask about her. And I always get to say, what you see is what you get, and she's terrific. Gwen and I go back a long way. We actually were print journalists together. When print meant newspaper. If you and Gwen were working on the same story, you were worried because you knew she would beat you. Gwen Eiffel represents journalism at its best. She's skeptical about everything but cynical about nothing. 
The ingredients of her success are pretty obvious. She's smart, great with words, and keeps her cool even under the brightest of lights. It's been my pleasure to watch her rise to the top of her profession. Gwen, your skill and integrity as a journalist make me proud to work for PBS. Gwen's cool, you know, she just has this an, an air about her where people like her, they want to listen to her, and when people ask me what it's like to, to sit around with Gwen Eiffel, I always just say, you know, if there was a Gwen Eiffel baseball card, I'd carry it around in my wallet. Gwen, you've been a trailblazer all your life, and never more so than now, as part of our stunning two women PBS anchor team. You're the best kind of journalist who sees around corners and makes sure we cover stories and trends we might otherwise miss. I'm so proud to work with you. Working with you is a great honor, and I feel privileged every day. You set the tone for the news hour, and you hold the bar high for yourself and for our entire newsroom. You challenge us to think critically and to avoid making assumptions starting at the morning meeting all through the day. You inspire me to be a better journalist, and you do that for all of us in the newsroom, and you do that all while being a great friend and mentor to your colleagues. I was uh, at the Ace Hardware in Jackson, Wyoming, ready to make my payments, and I got up to the cashier, and he said, you must be very special. And I said, excuse me? He said, you must be very special. Why? Because you're on Washington Week with Gwen Eiffel. So Gwen, you are big in Jackson, Wyoming at Ace Hardware. One of my favorite memories uh, working with Gwen is her use of the word cojones on a live national television show. There's a saying that you can't pick your relatives, and I think you could add co-workers to that. So how lucky were we when you brightened our studio door 16 years ago? Congratulations, Gwen. You should win all the awards. I'm so happy for you, and I can't wait to be back around the table with you. Congratulations, Gwen, on the fourth estate award. I can't think of anyone who deserves it more. Hello, friend. Hello, Gwen. Where are you, by the way? I'm out here on the set by myself. Listen, I'm always proud of you, and now I can add my words to those of everyone else for this latest richly deserved award. Congratulations. Congratulations, and many, many more. Gwen, congratulations. We're so excited for you. Congratulations, Gwen. Nobody deserves this more than you. Uh, you're our absolute favorite, and Theo sends his best. Gwen, here's wishing you all the best for winning this wonderful award. Congratulations. Well done, my dear. Congratulations, Gwen. I can't think of anyone more deserving of this honor, and I can't wait to see you back um, at the round table. Congrats. Congratulations to a great colleague, an extraordinary woman, and a very dear friend. Bravo, Gwen. Congratulations, Gwen. Congratulations, my friend. Gwen, I've known you for a long time at newspapers and on television. There is nobody who is a better representative of the fourth estate than you are. Gwen, I am proud to know you. I'm proud to be one of the panelists on Washington Week. Congratulations. Congratulations on this tremendous achievement tonight. You deserve it. Gwen, I am so lucky to work with you day in and day out. And this country is so fortunate to have you right where you are. Congratulations on this richly deserved Fourth Estate Award. G-W-E-N, Gwen, Gwen, Gwen! Congratulations, Gwen! Congratulations, Gwen! Okay, and that ends this vice presidential debate. I'm going back over to public television with Jim Lair, where you won't be seeing me for another four years. Good night. <laughs> I would now like to introduce our leadoff speaker, who is an award-winning journalist, author, and correspondent. She has worked for the New York Times, PBS, NPR, including a stint as bureau chief in South Africa for both NPR and CNN. She's written several books about her experiences with integration and the civil rights movement. She has won Peabody and Emmy Awards during her outstanding career, please welcome the one and only Charlene Hunter Galt. Well, I guess since there are two other people who are going to do tributes to Gwen, this represents age before beauty. 
but I tried to be beautiful tonight for you. <laughs> wait, 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 I only have three minutes up here, so don't, no, no. Um, two years after I left the News Hour to live in and work out of South Africa, Gwen joined the News Hour. I hadn't known Gwen up close and personal when I was at the News Hour, but by the time she got there, I was living in South Africa, and I had learned a couple of words in Xhosa. And my favorite was Ubuntu. And it means I am who I am because you are who you are. And while I got into the profession a few years ahead of Gwen, not that many Gwen did, don't, don't get, you know, all that, I reached back and took inspiration from Gwen. Because of her life, and I understood the source of what you just heard on that wonderful tribute to her. I, under source, I understood the source because it bound us as sisters, sisters I think that we are today. For example, Gwen is the daughter of an AME minister, as am I. And what that told me about Gwen was that early in her life, she, like I, was equipped with a layer of armor from the church's teachings. Armor that served me well and served her as we traversed roads not usually traversed by women who look like us. It reminds me of Viola Davis's quote from Harriet Tubman and her words in the 1800s. Gwen, too, could have easily said the same words that Viola said the night she won. Everybody knows what she won, okay? And what she said was, in my mind, I see a line. And over that line, I see green fields and lovely flowers and beautiful white women with their arms stretched over that line. I'm not doing as good as Viola, but I'm gonna try. <laughs> with arms stretched over that line, but I can't seem to get there, no how. I can't seem to get over that line. And so when I read that while interning at the Boston Herald American, a co-worker wrote to Gwen a note that said, nigger go home. Now remind, let me, let me just say, I only use that word in context, but this was a context you need to know about. It said, nigger go home. The armor crafted for Gwen in the AME church and her AME family made her, I just knew that she would be able to have those words slid off of her moral armor like the oil sliding down from the armor of an ancient gladiator. And Gwen went not only to get over that line but added color to the outstretched arms waiting in those green fields of our profession, encouraging other women of color to follow in her footsteps. Moral armor that Gwen wore and moral teaching that took her into her work as a professional journalist, journalist you just heard about. For while Gwen's reporting knew no boundaries, it is a known fact that Gwen served as the conscience of the news hour, if and when conscience, as well as professionalism, was called for, not least on the ongoing challenges of covering race. You saw it the other night when she spoke to Ta-Nehisi Coates. And while we were both sharing being first which you have heard and know about from Gwen's groundbreaking life. Gwen's armor kept her grounded 
and focused on her job and not her history-making moments. Such professionalism, as well as never forgetting where she came from, led Gwen late to add another layer of sisterhood armor with me when she was made an honorary member of Delta Sigma Theta. <laughs> but it was a sorority that I chose to join many years ago because of their commitment to racial justice and their dedication to public service. In Gwen's case, her public service included and continues to include providing viewers with what the news hour calls news that can be used by citizens in order to help them make good choices about the life lives that they lead. So finally, let me say, one of the best payoffs of the sisterhood that Gwen and I share is to be included in Gwen's tweets and selfies. <laughs> I mean, I get introduced to a whole new audience via Gwen, Gwen's tweets and selfies. Gwen, where's your camera right now? We need it, we need it. And so, let me close. With a tribute to Gwen, that includes my sisterly love. Yeah, get it out. <laughs> She's getting out the selfie now. I've already posted it on Facebook, Gwen, so I'm ahead of you for once. <laughs> but my tribute includes my sisterly love, my deepest professional respect, captured in the song I normally love to sing, but I'm gonna spare all of you tonight. This girl is on fire. <laughs> Well, if you keep applauding like that, I might sing it. But at any rate, Gwen, may your flame continue to burn brighter and brighter in a field that needs your voice and what a voice it is on and off camera. A field that needs all of that and your conscience today more than ever. Congratulations on this award because you totally, totally deserve it and I hope you get it again and again and again. <laughs> Thank you. N next up, please welcome a familiar face to Gwen and all of us who read the Washington Post. He is also familiar to those of us who never miss PBS's Washington Week in Review. I'm speaking, of course, about Dan Balls, chief correspondent at the Washington Post. Dan has served as the paper's national editor, political editor, and White House correspondent. He's co-authored two books, including the bestseller, The Battle for America, 2008, and he received numerous awards, including the White House Correspondents Association's Merriman Smith Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dan Balls. Thank you, everyone. Um, let me just say, you are a very hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> I'll not make that mistake again. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be part of this great celebration for, for Gwen, richly deserved. Um, and by a happy coincidence, there's a certain nice symmetry for me personally on this. A few minutes ago, before this dinner started, I had the uh, pleasure of finishing up a conversation with John Norris, who has just written a new biography of Mary McGrory. Um, Mary received the Fourth Estate Award in 1998, and I'm not here to compare Gwen to Mary or Mary to Gwen. Uh, that would be an injustice to both of them. Their careers stand totally on their own. But the connection for me from the three of us having been together at the Post many years ago makes tonight ex extra special. Uh, you know, for friends of Gwen, life has become an enjoyable but predictable ritual. Each morning we go into the office, we check the latest comments from Donald Trump, 
We measure the size of the crowds at the most recent Bernie Sanders rally. We check in on the Clintons. We see if there's any news with Vice President Biden. We file repeatedly and check Twitter incessantly. And then, on most evenings, it seems, when we are done, we head off to the latest award ceremony for Gwen Ifill. <laughs> it is never ending. She may be the most feted person any of us ever knew. 20 honorary degrees, as the video said, countless awards for Washington Week and PBS reporting, splashy parties for a best-selling author, and of course, well-deserved international recognition. The headline from a recent award event read, <clears throat> Gwen Eiffel, honored at Italian embassy with opera and cheese and a journalism award. It's gotten to the point that some of us are thinking of starting a website to chronicle it all. It will be called galasforgwen.com. <laughs> I urge you to watch for it. Um, I can't remember exactly when I first met Gwen. I can remember vividly when I first really came to know Gwen. She was a reporter on the Metro staff at the Post at the time, and someone on the paper had the very good idea that they should bring all of the people who covered politics, whether they're on the national staff or the metro staff, together for a brown bag lunch. Well, I came to that lunch and I listened to people who I knew well and to people who I did not know well. And one person popped out and that was Gwen. What you see on television every night is what I saw that day. A vivid, sharp, intelligent, and engaging person. I have never forgotten it and therefore have never been surprised at the heights to which she has risen over the course of her very distinguished career. It has been a marvelous career. Before the Post, there was the Baltimore Evening Sun. From the Post, she went to the New York Times. No hard feelings there, Gwen. <laughs> then off to NBC and the Washington Bureau in the era of the great Tim Russert, and then on to PBS and the long and distinguished and multifaceted run she's had there. She now travels in some quite rarefied air as moderator of Washington Week and co-anchor with Judy Woodruff of the NewsHour and as an all-around interviewer for PBS. But what remains true about Gwen is what has always been true about her. She is at her core a tough-minded and fiercely independent journalist and reporter. As long as I've known Gwen, she has treated spin from political operatives the way it should be treated and she has seen through politicians trying to put something past the public. She has never stopped learning or reporting, and in all the best ways, she is a role model for all of us in our profession. She is unflappable. We see that around the table each week at Washington Week. And of course, she gave new meaning to the showbiz exhortation, Break a Leg, when in, 19, in 2008, she fell down her stairs three nights before the vice presidential debate uh, and went ahead and moderated it anyway, with, without painkillers, as I recall. One little known fact about that night, Gwen, Gwen refused to be brought on stage in a wheelchair. And so the people, she said, I want to go in on crutches. She had never been on crutches before. And anybody who's been on crutches knows how difficult it is to be on crutches. And there was a carpet there, and people were worried. So the, some of the producers of the program arranged for two strapping varsity football players to be at her arms as she came into the, into the, uh, the hall for the debate. And uh, as related to me, I'm not sure who was beaming more, the football players or Gwen. <laughs> now, you might think that Gwen is always sweet and lovely, and most of the time she is. When panelists for Washington Week walk into the studio, Gwen is already there, moving to her pregame playlist. Chaka Khan's I'm Every Woman, Bob Marley's Is This Love, the Isleys Who's That Lady, or Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight. These are, these are not all on my playlist, but they are Gwen's. Her, her, some of her colleagues say that her secret fantasy is to be a backup singer. The only problem with that is anybody who knows Gwen is, knows that she is not backup to anyone. Um, don't let this pregame music ritual fool you, however. She can be a stern taskmaster on the set. The rules at Washington Week begin when we hit the green room, where no one is allowed to talk about the subjects about which we are about to talk on the air. More than once, she has admonished violators of that rule. During the program, hand and eye signals are used to convey your time is up. Um, one is to take a pen and put it down in front, 
if people miss that, there is the Eiffel evil eye. <laughs> There's also a rule that cell phones are to be turned off completely, which in this day and age is something of an anachronism, but nonetheless, we do put up with it. Apparently, there was one violator of that rule who has not ever been invited back to Washington Week. Gwen has done remarkable service as moderator of Washington Week, <clears throat> and I say that beyond the lively conversation that she directs around the table each Friday night. She has taken an institution known primarily as a domain of white men, and dare I say older white men, and turned it into a reflection of the real America. Around the table now are more women, more reporters of color, and the best of the younger generation on the beat. This is no small accomplishment. It has been done in the way Gwen would do it, simply by making sure that the arena was fully staffed with the best in the business. She has also developed an incredibly loyal set of viewers. I know this from personal experience as I travel around the country. It doesn't matter whether I'm in a rental car vehicle, uh, at a political rally, sometimes just walking along the street. People ask about the program and about Gwen. They love the program. They are enchanted with Gwen. And these tributes sometimes come from unexpected places and people, as I've related to Gwen over the years. Nick the doorman at one of the Chicago hotels. Fred, the, the ex-barista at a Starbucks near the old Obama headquarters. A clerk at Macy's in San Francisco taking a smoking break one Friday afternoon. All of them stop me to say how much they enjoy and watch Gwen and care for her. I want to say one last thing before I stop. We're, we're here to extol Gwen's extraordinary accomplishments and talents as a journalist, and, and they are there are obviously many. Above all, however, Gwen is a woman of enormous character and integrity, someone who has broken barriers in journalism and in life. She exemplifies the virtues of friendship, family, faith, and loyalty. And like many here today, I have seen that firsthand for many years and feel privileged by that experience. Gwen, you are the best. Congratulations. Thank you, Dan. Our next speaker is one of the most respected voices in American journalism, NPR's Michelle Norris. As special correspondent, she produces in-depth profiles, interviews, and series. These have included the Peabody Award-winning Race Card Project. She's a former ABC News correspondent where she won both an Emmy and a Peabody for the network's coverage of the September 11th attacks. She is the author of the memoir, The Grace of Silence. She was also my colleague at the University of Minnesota's student newspaper, the Minnesota Daily. Please welcome Michelle Norris. John, thanks for the shout out for the Minnesota Daily. We're, I'll, I'll slip you a 20 and you just won't talk about anything. <laughs> Later on. It's so wonderful to be here and to celebrate my dear friend, my sister friend, Gwen Eiffel. You've heard people talk about her professional accomplishments. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but also about who she is as a person. Um, Dan, you said you didn't remember exactly when you met Gwen Eiffel. I remember exactly when I met Gwen Eiffel because we were at a convention and um, I had access to a car, and she rolled up on me and basically said that, I hear you have access to a car. <laughs> I wanna go shopping. <laughs> I said, girl after my own heart. So uh, that was NABJ uh, Dallas. There are people in this room who remember exactly what year that was. It was, it was some time ago. Um, so I remember exactly when I met her, but I remember the moment when I decided that I wanted to take her into my life as a dear friend, and that was in the newsroom at the Washington Post. Uh, I was there for an interview, and I was waiting to go in to talk to Milton Coleman, 
And Gwen saw me across the room, and I was in the metro section, and she was in the national section, and there was a great divide between the metro and the national section. But she ran over to the metro section and said, girl, I remember you. And I remember you said it was something that had to do with my nails right, at that time. Right, right. Yeah, and um, I was younger then. And uh, <coughs> what she said to me was, she said, before you go in and do this interview, ask for $10,000 more than you were prepared to ask for. <laughs> because that's what the boys would do. What you actually said was, that's, that's what the white boys, boys would do. <laughs> And I was empowered, and I went in, and I, my shoulders squared, and my spine stiffened a little bit, and I didn't get all $10,000, but I got more than I would have gotten if I hadn't had that encounter. When I was asked to speak tonight, the one thing that I thought about was uh, uh, something that the great educator and author and poet Anna Julia Cooper once said, and I'm not gonna read the entire thing, but what she essentially says is that where and when I enter, speaking about herself, she says she essentially brings the world along with her. And Gwen, that is the way I think about you. When and where you enter, you so often bring the world with you. That was demonstrated in that brief encounter in the newsroom that day. It's demonstrated in the way that you pay it forward. Gwen had a mentor when she was in college, Professor Poole, and she's been paying it forward ever since by mentoring other students. She makes sure that when she enters the room that she always is looking in the rear view mirror to make sure that young people are coming up behind her. Every night you sit at a desk on a television set and help us better understand the world. And every Friday, and it's appointment viewing for most of us, you sit at a desk filled with reporters who talk about what they know, not what they think, what they know. And what you might not know is when she populates that table, she looks, yes, for more people of color and more young people, but always for people who have been out reporting. She's not interested in anyone's opinion. She wants people to bring with them their knowledge and their notebooks. And if you watch enough television, you know that that is unique. We know that Gwen can be tough. Oh, I said it in the best possible way. We know that she demonstrates grit, and even when she does that, again, she's always thinking about bringing other people, expanding horizons. We've heard about her debate performance. Um, when facing John Edwards and Dick Cheney, she's perhaps one of the few people who've ever told Dick Cheney, that's all you've got. <laughs> you remember that moment? He asked for more time, and she said, that's all you've got. But in that debate, she also asked how those two gentlemen would deal with AIDS at a time when women of color were in the bullseye of the epidemic. Putting an issue in the bullseye for media scrutiny at a time when the issue or the woman suffering from that disease without a cure were not receiving nearly enough attention. She brought those women into that room that night. And years later, when she moderated the 2008 vice presidential debate, she demonstrated grit once again, as we've heard, when she moderated that debate without painkillers, having just broken an ankle, what Dan did not tell you is how she broke that ankle. Can I tell them? Yeah. She was walking down the stairs from her bird's nest on the third floor where her office is, and she tripped on a book. You know what book it was? The biography of Sarah Palin. And when she was carried onto the stage, you remember their names, don't you? <laughs> Buck and Tim, see? <laughs> she's tough, but she's also funny. Um, and she demonstrates that in a, in, in a very particular way um, that she might not like me to share this story, but she's often mistaken for someone else that you know quite well. She's often mistaken for Donna Brazil. I don't understand that. But apparently people walk up to Gwen all the time and say, hello, Donna, and people walk up to Donna all the time and say, hello, Gwen. Now, that would make me want to take umbrage, let me just say that. But instead, she once again demonstrates grit, but also grace and goodwill. And Donna and Gwen have talked about printing buttons that say, I'm not Gwen, and <laughs> I'm not Donna. For many people, when they climb life's ladder, their circles become tighter and smaller and more selective. And that is not true of Gwen. Gwen's circle is ever widening. Her holiday celebrations are the stuff of legend. You now have to park blocks away to get to her home. 
She is always checking on people. She remembers people's, she remembers the names of spouses and children and birthdays. I, I, I'm sure if I talk about this long enough, I can get an amen course in this room from people who have heard from her when they're climbing up the rough side of the mountain, from people who have heard from their, when they're perhaps not pushing themselves as hard as they can because she will tell you when there's with a shovel, and that's a good thing. She's always thinking about other people. And it is important to recognize that all of us grew up at a time and during a moment when the idea that someone who looked and sounded like our dear friend Gwen could occupy such a space, that is something that we could not take for granted. And this award is like an exclamation point on a glorious and accomplished career, and not just because of that, but because she upholds the standard of journalism. She is always looking for people to do their best. She's always looking for fairness and balance, and she's always looking at that beacon that reminds us that despite all the changes in, this, in our time, when, when news is so often like snacking on Cheetos, she is, to, she is there to make sure that she gives us protein in our media diet every single day, and especially on Friday nights. I want to say congratulations from all of us. And thank you, thank you for being the wonderful person that you are. We know that you have great things ahead of you. And I know that this might seem strange, and I've said this before, but one of the, the reasons that we celebrate Gwen, and I notice it in the picture there, is when she delivers the news each night, she delivers it with a smile on her face, and that's no small thing. When you think about Gwen, the image that comes to mind is one of her smile her openness, and you don't see a lot of anchors, particularly a lot of women, because in honesty, we're always so busy trying to convey authority that we don't often smile. And when her, and your smile is like an extended hand that says, join me, or as we like to say, come on in, the water is fine. Her intelligence is contagious in the best possible way, and she has a big and broad stage to share that with all of us. Her courage is contagious because we will never know how many young people are out there that will look at her and maybe set their sights a little bit higher. When and where you entered this profession, you lifted us all up. This crazy craft of journalism that is changing so much, you've been a standard bearer, a gold standard for all of us. You've made the constellation that much more magnificent. We are so fortunate to be your colleagues. I am so fortunate to be your friend. And America is so fortunate to have you where you are every night of the week. Love you. Thank you, Michelle. The panel that recommended tonight's award winner is one of the most distinguished committees of National Press Club members that I have ever seen. Barbara Cochran and I were honored that they were part of this process, and I know that Gwen feels the same way. The selection committee is David Calloway, Editor-in-Chief of USA Today, Betsy Fisher-Martin of Fisher-Martin Media and Executive Residence at American University, formerly of Meet the Press. Kevin Merida, managing editor of the Washington Post. Gordon Peterson, former anchor at WJLA TV. Madalika Sika, executive editor of Mick News and former executive editor of National Public Radio. Rachel Smokin, executive editor of CNN Politics. And Marilyn Thompson, Deputy Editor of Politico. Some members of our selection panel are in the audience tonight. Could you stand and be recognized? <laughs> so what has resonated through the evening and what you heard from the speakers tonight is Gwen's gold standard status as a journalist. She has a world-class reputation for fairness, depth, intellect, and professionalism. 
Her accomplishments cross all media platforms, as we've heard, and of course, she's a straight shooter, including her days at the New York Times, the Washington Post, and NBC News. I can't think of a reporter more qualified to cover the news in our nation's capital and around the world as co-anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour and moderator and editor of Washington Week. She touches on every important issue that affects Americans everywhere. And she's as well versed in foreign affairs and international newsmakers as she is in the crazy and ever-changing landscape of presidential elections. Tonight, Gwen, you become the 43rd inductee into what I consider journalism's true Hall of Fame. You join people like Walter Cronkite, Bob Woodward, Simeon Booker, Mary McGrory, Helen Thomas, David Broder, Eric Severide, Tom Brokaw. I could go on and on. So, by the authority given to me by 3,100 members of the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists, it is my honor to present the 2015 Fourth Estate Award to Gwen Eiffel. Thank you. What could there be left to say? <laughs> Except that years later, I ran into the, the mother of one of those football players who helped me across the stage. And she said, oh, my son helped you walk on stage. I thought, your son, I believe you are my age. Oh my God. <laughs> I lost it after your son, it's true. <laughs> but it was very helpful at the time. Some of you know I'm getting over a little bout of the wonderful crud, and so if I begin to cough uncontrollably, don't call the cops, I'm fine. I, I wanted to be here, obviously, because it's no fun to give an award and not show up, but also because it was really important for me to be able to acknowledge everything that we've heard. I, I, this is a room full of uh, friends and mentors and the National Press Club, of course, for this amazing honor, I thank you all. Thank you to Michelle my dear friend, who is also the mother of my godchildren, for being the friend who, like me, hopped from newspaper to newspaper, to commercial broadcasting, to public broadcasting, and it was all very scary, and we found a path, and we found a platform to tell stories that are important to us. We also survived it by calling each other on the phone and saying, is this as crazy as it seems? And we would get each other through. I wanna thank Dan, who no matter what he says now, he was the beacon for me when I started covering national politics. He assumed I could do the work. Now, this is not an unimportant issue for young people, especially in the room, to have someone who assumes this for you and believes in you. He encouraged me how to, in, in doing the work and then he showed me how to do it when I fell short. And he always did it with good cheer and believe me, I didn't always give him reason to. He told me also how to be professionally competitive and generous at the same time. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Plus, he's a great friend. And thank you to Charlene hunter Galt and to my partner who couldn't be here tonight, Judy Woodruff. I have to tell you, both of those women in ways that they're not aware of probably fully paved the way for me to be standing here and for generations of women, both behind a camera and in front of a camera. These are women, these two women, who care deeply about important issues. Charlene cares deeply about civil rights, and Judy cares deeply about disability rights. And they have figured out how to meld their interests and their passions with their journalism and shed an important spotlight on undertold stories every single day. I can't tell you what a joy it is to work with Judy every day. It's one thing to sit next to 
your coworker. It's another thing to sit next to your girlfriend and to be able to do the jobs that you both know you were born to do. I strive to be like both of them every day. I came to this business early. I liked to write, I was about nine years old, but it turns out I needed deadlines. I was a preacher's kid, it's true. <laughs> Pardon me. And there's no better place to learn about politics, it turns out, than the church, which is a deeply, deeply political environment. <laughs> and I was raised in a family where our parents taught us to have high expectations of others, but also of ourselves. My brother and sister are here tonight, and they can testify to this fact. My brother and sister can also testify, and my sister-in-law, to how I play dominoes, and they keep me sane. It never occurred to me to accept no as an answer. Either the no meant I had to step up my game or the no meant that there was something else that was meant for me to do at that time. There have been opportunities that you thought you wanted and then you didn't get them and it turned out that was a good thing and you learn how to make that part of your life. Because it turns out for sure journalism was what I was meant to do. I embrace this honor tonight because it is bestowed by peers who also know what journalism is and what it can be when we achieve, when we fall short, and when we aspire to more. At our best, we are all truth tellers, although sometimes imperfect ones. At our best, we reject bias and understand that the most dangerous bias is found in the stories that we do not tell. At our best, we are agents of uplift, remembering that there is good as well as bad in the world and that it's important to know the difference between the two. God knows. I have been extremely fortunate throughout my career to work for and with the best and the brightest that journalism has to offer. I sucked in everything. I sucked in everything that Dan Balls taught me, everything Kevin Merida taught me, everything Larry Bivens on the campaign trail and Sonia Ross taught me, and everything Tim Russert taught me, and everything Les Crystal taught me at the News Hour. The names and the list goes on and on and on, and most of them don't even know how much they taught me along the way. They taught me about whether it's what it's like and how one gets to write a book. They taught me how to host a news program. They taught me how to cover a campaign or when adversity strikes, when it's best to grin and bear it or at least bear it. Every step in my career has left, led to the next one. Even when I didn't see the next step coming, God knows I usually didn't, I would trip over it. The experiences along the way, whether it was questioning a sitting president in the White House moderating a debate with 67 million people looking at your back, which, you know, better than your front, I suppose. <laughs> or when it came to hugging, as you saw, the survivor of a mass shooting. It's allowed me to stand here tonight, all those opportunities, all those chances, all those gifts, and all those blessings. It allows me to stand here tonight and say thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Gwen. As I said, you are now part of Journalism's Hall of Fame. As such, you will be permanently memorialized here in the club. But you know, as well as I, that the greatest thing about the National Press Club is not what we put on the wall, but it's what we do each day for the profession of journalism. It's the mug. And the mug. and the programs we conduct, <laughs> and how we serve as the place where news happens. Therefore, it is my pleasure to present you with the greatest gift that we have to give, and that is lifetime membership to the greatest journalism organization on the planet. I have here, I have here your membership card, and as you are the 43rd winner of the Fourth Estate Award, your membership number is 43. Welcome, Gwen, to the National Press Club. Thank you. <laughs> Better than a mug. <laughs> Better than a mug. And we have one more thing. Tonight's program 
as you see on the screen, features a well-drawn likeness of Gwen created by Matt Worker of Politico. We have the original signed and framed so that you will have a lasting memory from this night. And here it is. <laughs> Congratulations once again. Before we retire to the Holman Lounge next door for cordials, I have a few closing reminders. First off, if you're the lucky holder of a program that has a gold sticker on the back, that lovely orchid centerpiece on the table is yours for the taking. <laughs> Check your programs. See if you've got the gold sticker on the back. If, if you do not have the gold sticker, do not take the orchid. We're, we're sorry, but you've got to have the gold sticker. Also, if you bid on items in the silent auction, be sure to go to the front desk to see if you won. And also, don't forget to pay for the item that you won. And this evening's event would not be possible without the hard work of some very special people. In particular, I want to thank the National Press Club and National Press Club Institute staff, the Institute's Executive Director, Julie Hsu, and her colleague, Crystal White. They deserve our thanks for all they did in putting this evening together. And the National Press Club's Executive Director, Bill McCarran, makes this event a priority each and every year. And please, let's have a round of applause for our executive chef, Susan Delbert, and her staff. Wasn't that meal delicious? Thank you, Susan. And I would like to thank Gail DeGeorge, Barbara Bird, Natasha Pino, and the Fourth Estate Dinner Committee for all its work in planning this event. And again, I want to thank that Fourth Estate Award Committee for recommending Gwen as our award winner this year. And finally, a word of thanks to all of our members and all of you who attended tonight's dinner. You are the club. You are what makes this a special place. And I'm so happy to see so many of you here tonight. It's been a great evening. And remember, it's not over. Please join us next door in the Holman Lounge for a nightcap. Thank you all, and good night. is a journalist and former correspondent of NPR and PBS, among other things, and we'll be hearing a little more later. And Michelle Norris is a special correspondent for National Public Radio. Gail DeGeorge, a former editor with Bloomberg, is the chairwoman of this year's Fourth Estate Dinner. I would also like to recognize the leadership of the National Press Club and of the National Press Club Journalism Institute. Will board members and officers of those two organizations please stand and be recognized. <laughs> we have past presidents of the National Press Club here tonight. Would past presidents please stand and be recognized? <laughs> One former president is not with us tonight, but he does deserve special recognition. More than 40 years ago, Don Larrabee brought us our very first Fourth Estate Award dinner, and that night we honored the great Walter Cronkite. Don was instrumental in putting together countless Fourth Estate dinners since then.
thank you, Don, for giving the club this signature event. We wish you were here with us. And tonight's dinner benefits the National Press Club Journalism Institute. To tell us a little bit more about the Institute, please give a warm welcome to its president, Barbara Cochran. Well, hello, everyone. It's so nice to see you all here tonight. And I'm especially pleased that we're saluting Gwen Eiffel. Gwen has been a friend for many years, and it has been a real pleasure to follow the amazing trajectory of her career. She mastered reporting first for print and now for television. And I'm a huge fan of Gwen's ability to get to the heart of any story she covers and to lead a civil and insightful conversation about the most important issues of our day. She's also a role model for women and for women of color and inspires countless young reporters to do better, to do more, and to be more. The National Press Club Journalism Institute is the nonprofit educational arm of the National Press Club. As the journalism profession evolves in new ways, the Institute provides training programs designed to keep journalists at the forefront of innovative reporting tools and techniques. The Institute also honors great journalism through its annual awards program and works to build the next generation of journalists through a scholarship program. <clears throat> Tonight, I want to take a moment to tell you about this year's recipient of the National Press Club's Diversity Scholarship for Studies in Journalism. Her name is Megan Zanise from Westchester, Ohio, and she's a freshman at Miami University of Ohio. I'll let Megan tell you the rest of her inspiring story in her own words, which she delivered when she was officially named this year's scholarship recipient. Let's watch. I have always loved words. It's why there's a stack of 50 books on my bedroom floor waiting to be read because there's simply no room left on my bookshelf. It's why I skipped a trip to an amusement park when I was seven years old in favor of staying home to read the new Harry Potter book. <laughs> it's why I started my own blog in sixth grade and why my little brother still yells at me for using big words that he doesn't understand. It's why I'm a card-carrying member of the Grandma Police and a columnist at Major League Baseball. It's why I took an interest in public speaking so I can share my story to motivate and inspire others. It's why I want to be a journalist and publish a memoir and do a TED Talk. It's why I'll be attending Miami University in Oxford, Ohio this fall as part of a writing program, uh, honors program in writing for the media. And it's why I'm here tonight. From the get-go, my lifestyle has been anything but typical and not always by choice. I was born with a very rare neurological disorder that rendered me unable to feel pain, temperature, and touch. I'm also deaf. It's the fact that there are an estimated 50 cases of this disorder in the world doesn't give me a different take on the world, I don't know what does. I spent most of my childhood surrounded by doctors and nurses and therapists, and not a whole lot of kids my own age. That's when I started retreating into books as an escape and writing down my thoughts as an outlet. You now have an additional opportunity to contribute. There is a silent auction happening in our lobby. There are some great items. There's a week-long stay at a magnificent home in France. There's VIP tickets to The Late Show with Stephen Colbert in New York. There's a one-night stay at the historic homestead in Hot Springs, Virginia, or the exclusive Salamander Resort and Spa in Middleburg, Virginia. Please take a moment to have a look and place those bids. You don't have much time. Bidding closes at 8.15. We want to send a special thank you to our silent auction sponsors, and they are listed in your program. We want to give special thanks to our two gold level sponsors for tonight's dinner. They are Bloomberg and Toyota. Both companies have been longtime supporters of the Journalism Institute, 
and we are grateful to both of them. Bloomberg employees, Andrea Snyder and Angela Greiling Keene, serve with me on the press club and institute boards, respectively. Ed Lewis of Toyota serves on the Journalism Institute board and is someone whom we have counted on for so long in so many ways. We also want to thank our Silver Level sponsors. Brown Capital Management, which has supported this dinner for a number of years. Thank you to Eddie C. Brown, the author of Beating the Odds, Eddie Brown's Investing in Life Strategies. The American Petroleum Institute is now a sponsor for the fourth year, and we want to thank API for their sponsorship. The National Cable Telecommunications Association is a three-time sponsor at the silver level. Rob Stoddard, NCTA's Senior Vice President for Communications and Public Affairs, serves on the Journalism Institute Board, and we thank him for his support. Our bronze level sponsors are Syngenta, a global leader in agribusiness. They are a new sponsor this year. Thank you, Syngenta. And Ridgewells, we extend our thanks to Ridgewells for again providing the lovely tablecloths. Let's have a round of applause for all of our sponsors. Now, please enjoy your delicious dinner prepared by the club's executive chef, Susan Delbert. So at a young age, I learned that words are powerful. And I'm so glad that I had the right ones, the inspiring ones, the courageous ones available to me when I was growing up. I want to be that voice for the next generation. And I want to harness the power of those words as I continue my career in journalism. I could not be more grateful that all of you here at the Press Club believe in that dream and have taken, helped me take the next step forward in achieving it. Thank you very much. Pretty amazing. And because of your support of events like tonight's dinner, the Journalism Institute is able to help promising young journalists like Megan. So thank you for being here and thank you for helping the next generation of great journalists. Now I'll turn the program back over to John. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. So what you just saw shows some of the Institute's excellent work. And if you came to the club to see the excellent training and professional development that goes on here, you will see an additional example of that excellent work. But there is more. Throughout 2015, we have focused our fight for press freedom on three journalists who right now are being held in foreign prisons. They are Austin Tice, a freelance journalist being held in Syria, Khadija Ismailova, who is being held in Azerbaijan, and Jason Rezaian, a Washington Post reporter who has been jailed in Tehran for 450 days. Earlier this year, the Press Club and Journalism Institute boards voted to transfer press freedom programs from the club to the Journalism Institute. That means that for the first time, some proceeds from this evening's dinner will support our important press freedom efforts. So tonight, we are doing more than thinking about Austin, Karija, and Jason. We are raising money so that we can continue our work to get these journalists released, and we are raising money so that no more reporters are jailed just for doing their jobs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? Well, good evening. My name is John Hughes. I'm an editor for Bloomberg First Word. That's Bloomberg News' breaking news desk here in Washington. And I am the president of the National Press Club. Thank you. I want to welcome you here tonight. This is an exciting night for the club. It's one of our biggest nights of the year, in fact. We will recognize Gwen Eiffel with our very highest honor the Fourth Estate Award. Woo! 
Now, Gwen, quite simply, is one of the most prolific and respected journalists of our time. Her career has spanned the pinnacles of both print and broadcast. She has authored a highly regarded book about politics and race. And of course, we know her for her, fast, her past work as a debate moderator. Her current role is co-anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour, along with Judy Woodruff. The team has been called the heart and soul of this legendary news program. Gwen brings her trademark analytical skills and journalist savvy to the show, along with her sterling reputation for fairness and balance. She is also, I have to say, one of the most well-liked and collegial members of the Fourth Estate here in Washington. We are so pleased to be honoring her tonight. Gwen, welcome and congratulations. Now we are joined tonight by a head table of distinguished guests and I want to introduce them to you now. Please hold your applause until everybody up here has been introduced and then we'll, uh, we'll give them an applause at one time. So from the audience's left, Barbara Bird is a fourth estate dinner committee member. Dan Balls is political reporter for the Washington Post. Barbara Cochran of the University of Missouri is president of the National Press Club Journalism Institute. And of course, our guest of honor is Gwen Eiffel. Charlene Hunter-Galt 